hear the prayers of your people, that we who justly suffer the consequence of our sin may be mercifully delivered by your goodness to the glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Take what belongs to you and go. 
I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge me my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first last. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, o Christ. By the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit, we are bold to confess. I believe in God.
Do you not know that in a marathon all runners compete, but only one receives the crown? Paul references that crown, for they compete for that wreath which is perishable. It's one of those many times in Holy Scripture that it benefits us to know the culture, the history of the world in which he is speaking. And he's speaking as someone in the first century, someone educated in all things Greek and Roman. There was a crown of laurel leaves, which was the prize that was first given out at the Olympics to everyone who won in every category. That's what they had before medals. In the Roman Republic, they copied this crown to be the crown that would be worn by victorious generals. They would come back from a war having won a great battle and a triumphal parade would be held and they would put a crown on their head of laurel leaves and the Republic, it was the closest thing they got to a crown because it was too reminiscent of the monarchy they had overthrown early in the Republican era. <coughs> the Romans made sure that this crown made of laurel leaves a symbol of power, but also of peace, was real. It was made from vegetation. It faded. That was the idea. It was an award and a prize that you could only wear for so long. You could only hang it on your wall for so long. It was meant to prevent tyranny from any one victorious general or any one great person assuming a power like that that the kings had had early in the days of their city-state, those kings that they despised. All the runners in the marathon run. All the competitors compete only for that which is temporary, which is in this world. This is what Paul is driving home. Not to be like one, as he says, boxing the air, but as one who runs ready to win the race by pummeling their flesh and subduing it, and he takes us back to our Old Testament reading with that great symbol, and I will digress to the King James version of this text that I prefer, where he says, God led all the people into the wilderness, they were baptized into Moses, fed the bread from heaven, water from the rock, that rock was Christ. But lo, God was unhappy with most of them, and lo, their corpses littered the wilderness. So much more graphic than overthrown in the wilderness and closer to the original Greek. God brought the people out of Egypt, out of bondage, out of his love and his mercy. He did everything for them, and yet there in the wilderness, lo, their corpses littered. Over a million people left Egypt in the Exodus. Approximately half of them are scattered among the desert sand dunes of the desert of sin, never ever having made it to the promised land and dying there in the sand. Of course, actually nobody that left Egypt is alive to enter the promised land. Even the faithful will die there because of their sin and their weakness. Only the new generation, the new beginning, will enter into the promised land flowing with milk and honey. And the reason goes back to those words, Meribah, quarrel. This place, like many, where the people of Israel argued with Moses and actually they were arguing with God. Did God bring us out into this wilderness to kill us with starvation? Well, of course not. He was feeding them bread from heaven every day. It was them that despised the bread from heaven. God, in his mercy, sometimes fed them quail, but within a few days they despised him again. When they thirsted, they said, did God bring us out here that we would die of thirst? But God gave them water. Miraculously springing from the rock, he found them water everywhere in the desert of Sinai, or sin. The people were never, ever content. Paul would say, they were not running the race as ones planning on winning it. Because it had nothing to do with the work they were putting in. 
the amount they were suffering, <coughs> and certainly not the degree to which they imagined that they were suffering the work of God that they should have marveled at, received with great rejoicing, they instead despised. They were not, as Paul would say, pummeling their flesh to subdue it. <coughs> Rather, they were boxing with the air. They were unhappy with everything that God gave them because it was never enough. The people in our gospel reading do the same thing, don't they? But they do it in a slightly more sly way. They realize, in their mind, somebody got something for nothing. And there's nothing that's more offensive to the human race, and especially independent-minded Americans, than the idea that somebody got something for nothing. All of the workers in the vineyard are hired at different times of day, but only those ones hired first thing in the morning are told the promise of what they will receive. And so when they line up at the end of the day, the ones who only worked one hour are given a denarius, the coin that represents about two or three days' wages. This was a good, good deal to work for a denarius a day in the first century. And the people hired first thing in the morning assumed what? We're going to get more. They only worked for an hour, and we worked all day. The obvious parallel to this in the kingdom of heaven is that those that arrived from birth, baptized Christians, called to be believers before they're able to speak or walk, are given the same gift of heaven as people on death row who repent and convert right before they're electrocuted. They get the same thing. They receive the same salvation promise, and it doesn't sit well with our human flesh. That's essentially what the people in the text are saying. The people that converted later should have got less, or we should have got more. <coughs> because like the Israelites, they're unhappy with the way God is giving out good things. Think about that. The Israelites in Sinai are mad because they're tired of getting miraculous bread from heaven. They're tired of plain water coming from the rock when God miraculously keeps them alive. The people in the Gospel text likewise have it too good. They begrudge God his generosity. That all things are his to do with as he pleases, to give out as he pleases, to withhold as he pleases, they are not, in either case, running the race as ones who would get the crown. They are boxing the air, not keeping themselves in submission. But then, that's the best part of the whole story. The Israelites in the wilderness are ungrateful, literally ingrate. They are not lovers of God or his works. They are not having any level of gratitude they have no level of acceptance. Everything they have, God has literally given them. Their freedom from slavery, their water, their food, their life sustained in a place where nothing could live on its own. And they are not happy. The people in the Gospel text are hired to do a job and made a promise. They are called by the Gospel, enlightened with the Spirit's gifts, to be sanctified and kept in the one holy Christian church, as our catechism would say. And yet they begrudge who was called earlier and who was called later, their eye always on what someone else had or what could be, rather than gratitude for what they have been given. <coughs> and God Almighty delivering the ultimatum or the final statement, of course, in the Gospel text, did I cheat you? Did I not give you exactly what you agreed to this morning? Didn't I give you exactly what was promised? What difference does it make? Was it not mine to do with as I please? See, in all of these cases, where they're running the race wrong, it isn't because they're not working hard enough, or thinking about it clear enough, or doing enough 
in God's program or design, always the failure is that they don't believe God. If we go back to the beginning, what is righteousness? When we find Abraham being called to follow God, to leave everything, to leave his father's house, the idols of his nation, to go into a new land where there is no civilization, nothing, and rough it because God called him to do so, we're told over and over again, Abraham believed God, and that was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham had no ability to be righteous. Being a human, born of flesh like ours, being, as the scripture said, dead in sin and transgression. The dead cannot raise themselves. They cannot save themselves. The dead can do no good works. The dead cannot pull themselves up by their bootstraps. They can achieve nothing. The dead are dead. They rot and are eaten away by the sinful and fallen world. Only God can make alive. And that's the key. The people in the gospel text are dead. They are dead. They do not have faith. They see what God has delivered, that exactly what he has promised, and it's not good enough because they do not believe him. They just wanted the money. The Israelites in the wilderness are not content to be given everything they need because they want more, because they lust after the things of the world, and they even go so far as to remember fondly their days of slavery, because those people, deep in their hearts, don't believe God. They followed his prophet into the wilderness with the promise of getting something better, better food, better money, better something, a country of our own. They wanted the things that were being discussed but they didn't believe in God or trust in Him who owns it all to distribute it fairly. They were unable to save themselves. The people in the gospel are unable to save themselves from their greed and jealousy. In the middle of this, Paul tells us, run the race as ones who will win. Because the winner does not depend on their own strength, merit, or worthiness. The one that will win the race and get the crown of glory is the one that has it given. The crown that doesn't fade, the eternal, perfect, monarchical, all-powerful, hierarchical crown in the heavenly realms, of which there is only one, belongs to our Lord Jesus Christ. On him, in him, through him, and with him, we are given all blessing. To believe in him is the only way to win the race. Because we don't win it, he does. Jesus, who came into the world to defeat sin, death, and the devil, the one in whom we are grafted according to our flesh and our spirit, he that passes through death and hell and the grave to eternal life, he is the one who drags us unerringly along to it all. Without him, without his Holy Spirit filling us, without the regeneration of baptism, without absolution, the Lord's Supper, all the ways that we are grafted into his body, we could not do anything different than argue against the Lord and Moses and be wretched and faithless in the wilderness, or to begrudge God in generosity and covet more, thinking of ourselves as worthy somehow because of our own good deeds because we're such wonderful people. In either event, we would be disqualified from the kingdom of heaven because we would be depending on our own strength to run the race. And the real winning of the race is done by Jesus, who drags us into himself. And all of this is pointed to not only in the gospel text, where they are lined up at the judgment day figuratively and given what is promised without dependence on any amount of work they did or did not do. But all the way back to that Old Testament reading, where Jesus himself is the bread from heaven, and the cloud, and the pillar of fire, and that beautiful image of Moses with the staff. The staff given to Aaron, 
the staff that will be put in pieces in the Ark of the Covenant later, a dead stick that we will see miraculous things happen to there in Sinai. It will be planted in the sand, and it will sprout life and fresh buds from its dry branches, death and resurrection. It parted the sea, inviting all to be baptized in the sea so that the unbeliever could be daily drowned in this contrition. And in this one singular beautiful moment, if you didn't catch it, Moses, like the centurion at the cross, strikes the rock. Out comes the water to water the people. We will see it again with that centurion when the blood and water of his covenant pour up. Right there in the text, the perfect symbol across 